Hello, everybody. This is Mike King, and welcome to Profiling Evil. I am so thrilled today to have a couple of guests with me. Of course, we have Chris McDonough, who you've each met uh, previously, but we have a couple of <clears throat> new guests with us that I uh, think you're really going to enjoy listening to today. Uh, the first is Robert Sell, who's the founder and the president of Trace Labs. And Robert, I'm going to just read this so I don't uh, foul this up. But uh, Robert's an experienced search and rescue officer in Canada, specializing in tracking lost people. And this is what intrigued me so much. Not only did he take this desire that uh, he has to help people and especially help families that are really in distress finding people that are lost, but he found a way to do something even bigger than that. And he came up with this idea of Trace Labs, a way to, to continue to do search and rescue, but use the World Wide Web as a method and means of being able to do that. Uh, he has an IT background, but, but he has 20 years of experience in the Canadian uh, federal government, also managing complex uh, solutions and building things. Together with our next guest, uh, Adrian Korn, who's the director of OSINT, which is open source intelligence operations at uh, Trace Labs. Uh, these two have created an amazing capability that law enforcement is just learning about. And we hope that this will continue to push out uh, information about them. But Adrian specializes in cyber threat intelligence and uh, security operations and has had a background in this area for a long, long time. But I should just mention both of them are educated. You're going to know that anyway, but they both have great degrees that uh, have helped them become experts in their field. Uh, last weekend, I uh, had the opportunity and was invited by them to come in as a judge on one of their uh, dark web operations where they sought out people that were uh, um, missing and trying to find information on them. It was absolutely fascinating to watch the nearly 600 people who had volunteered their time to come in and try to find missing people. This is one of the most remarkable things I have ever seen, guys, and, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the amazing introduction of Rob and I. Yeah, oh. thanks a lot, Mike. That was a great intro. I don't think I've ever had such a nice intro. <laughs> I was about <laughs> to say the same thing. <laughs> That's nice. Well, I'll tell you... Uh, um, what Chris and I would have given for something like what you have designed uh, when we were investigating cold cases and missing persons. I don't know, Chris, what are your thoughts? It would have been something. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, you guys are just cutting edge and it's going to be really exciting. I'm, I'm really excited about this particular uh, podcast here today and the, the show because uh, I, I think you guys are a game changer and, and definitely the way of the future. Definitely the way of the future. Thanks for having us on. It's great to be here. So um, today we're going to talk about the uh, case of Lauren DeMulo. Uh, this is a 29-year-old woman who disappeared in uh, in Cape uh, Coral. Thanks, Chris, in Cape Coral, yeah. Florida, uh, just last month. And it's really an intriguing case. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, more about this, but then I want to focus on how the dark web can help in cases like this. And so as we go through this um, discussion, uh, Adrian, Robert, just pipe up and, and, and let's just have some interaction and talk ab about things as we go through it. But, but let's get started. I wanted to start by kind of setting the stage. In the United States, there are roughly 600, some people say 800,000 people who disappear every year that are reported missing. Now, statistically, 83% of those people, according to the National Crime Information Center, are going to return home. But this leaves 104,000 people every single year in the United States that disappear and are never heard from again. This, this isn't uh, some guy who gets mad at his wife and goes to Las Vegas for the weekend. These are bona fide, real missing people, and their families are involved in this, and many of them may go an entire lifetime with ever hearing from these people again. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not against the law to come up missing and to go missing. Uh, so it becomes a really tragic problem. I did a little bit of math and I looked at statistic, statistically, if 104,000 people are truly considered missing in the United States, based on population, if we were to look at the world, 
we're actually looking at 2.250 million people every single year that disappear off of the map if those numbers remain consistent. And I don't know what your thoughts are, but I would suggest that in most third world countries, those those uh, statistics are much higher. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think, Mike, one of the uh, key things there is that, I mean, A, the number is really big, right? So that that's that's scary. But the second thing that I find is the most alarming is that we have a statistics there that says a lot of them will come back within, say, three days. Even more will come back within seven days. And that's great. But it's the ones that don't that I think that are, are really alarming because we have this mentality of thinking, well, they're probably going to come back. Let's just wait three to five days. Uh, and everything will be fine, probably. But when it when they don't, then we've wasted all that time. And I think that being able to shift our mindset to go, okay, while well, they're missing today, let's let's take this as an emergency. Let's take this very seriously today and start looking for those people the best we can. But um, traditional models have been difficult to do that um, because there's many other priorities uh, for law enforcement and for for the different agencies. So. I think that's, that's amazing. Cool. And I, I'd like to continue this discussion for a second and just throw out what would be the benefit, in your opinion, if law enforcement had some mechanism to immediately start looking into a missing persons cases? And could it be automated? Because they certainly don't have the bandwidth or the personnel mm -hmm. to do something like that. Adrian, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. Uh, what we typically see is law enforcement spends majority of time on a missing person's case in the first 48 hours. Those are typically the most crucial hours of investigation. Um, but if they could leverage the public's help to get them immediately engaged from the very beginning and actually do a call to action. So not just asking if they've seen the person, but if they could actually help law enforcement look for clues out on the open internet. And that's really where the Trace Labs model was born, to bring that in, to actually do a call to action to our global community, to say, hey, this person is missing. Can you leverage your cyber security skills and your hacking skills to go and look for clues out on the open internet to help find them? Um, and this whole concept, we, we call it open source intelligence. Um, you talked about it a bit in the beginning, Mike. But when we say open source intelligence, we really mean any piece of intel that you can find publicly available from places like the dark web, uh, the surface web, so being any website that a normal person can go to on their computer. There's concepts of like the deep web where there are pages that aren't really indexed by your typical search engines like Google. Um, and then there's stuff like social media as well. Yeah. So, so that's really cool. Um, Robert, take mm -hmm. us and, and kind of describe and define dark web, deep web, my web. Oh, geez. I think Adrian's going to be better at, at outlining those. That's more of his focus, more of his uh, uh, day Perfect. job. Type thing. So, yeah. Adrian, Adrian, the bus is coming your way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Uh, so when we talk about dark web, uh, dark web is essentially any website that you need a special browser called Tor. Tor stands for the onion router. Um, dark web is essentially pages that are not indexed by normal search engines and such. And you need to access it via this special browser um, where you can access all these pages that are kind of hidden from the rest of the world. Um, it's not really as hard as you think to access the dark web. Some people think you need to be a computer genius. All you need to do is download a browser that's similar to Firefox, actually, if you're familiar with that. And then you can begin accessing these pages. Um, when we talk about the surface web, this is your normal websites and uh, pages that you're going to be able to visit. Stuff like you know Facebook, Google, all of that. When we talk about the deep web, these are things that aren't indexed by all the search engines. So you kind of need to know exactly where to look on the internet to find um, that deep web page. Um, so an example would be looking through a public government database where you search someone's name. Um, you can definitely do this without any prior access, it being public. However, that, that result might not be indexed by the greater Google and Yahoo and Bing and et cetera. What's the 
chance that many police departments have anyone doing something like this. Yeah, you know, I think to Mike's point, I, I don't think a lot of agencies have the bandwidth to, you know, to put folks, you know, into the room with you, Adrian and Robert, to say, hey, what are we looking at here, right? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. What we've seen in our experience is that some of the larger agencies have their own dedicated cyber security teams where they're actually aware of all these techniques. Uh, their staff are getting trained. They're advancing their skill sets all the time. Um, for example, uh, I'm aware of Toronto Police. Um, Toronto is where I'm based. They have a very large cybersecurity team. Um, I believe it's up to 15 people now, and they specialize in uh, open source investigations, anything that involves uh, the cyber realm. However, when you look at the smaller agencies out there, they're not always well equipped with these special cyber teams. So that's really where our model kind of um, plays into that to provide them additional resourcing in the cyber realm where we have our experts, specialists, and enthusiasts all around the world helping them look for these missing people um, using only public information too, I should add. So something uh, that we uh, run our mission by at Trace Labs is that any piece of intel that our members find has to be public. They can't do any interaction with a missing person. They can't try to log into any accounts, contact anyone. They can't use any illegal hacking techniques as well. It's essentially looking at what's already out there on the public internet. And if there's something they find, then they can source that and submit it to us. And then that can be recreated by law enforcement on their end as well. Yeah. You know, you, you guys are even taking, I think, a higher road, uh, Robert, Adrian. You, when I watched uh, the, the uh, capture the flag last weekend, I was impressed mm -hmm. with the fact that, too, you're monitoring the people that you have helping in these kinds of things. They, they get points for doing it right, but they get disqualified if they do violate any of those rules. Yeah. And, and I think that's really impressive. I want to I want to just switch over real quick and talk about this case that we're looking at today, which is the case of a woman named uh, Lauren Demo Demolo. And this is a, a 29 year old white female who uh, disappeared uh, one morning. And the, the circumstances around the case were really intriguing because it's a mother of one. I think her child is about five years old. Uh, she's living with the same boyfriend that she's been living with for four years. So she sounds like she has a pretty stable relationship. Um, but she also sounds like she might have a, a drug addiction of sorts. Uh, Chris, what else did we learn about this gal as we looked at the case? So there's a couple of interesting things, uh, um, Mike, is two items of, um, you know, that belong to her were uh, discovered. Uh, her purse and I think um, some type of um, uh, shirt, some type of garment. And the, uh, the most interesting thing about those two discoveries is uh, the family, uh, her sister and her father uh, found the shirt like you know, a couple of days later, or, uh, you know, or thereabouts, I don't know the exact time frame yet, but, uh, and essentially they said they scoured that entire area uh, on numerous occasions. And then all of a sudden this shirt appears. So that, that's kind of a, an interesting uh, piece of this, right? Yeah. Let's, let's play that, Chris. I thought it was kind of, kind of an interesting news story. Family traveled here from out of state to help police search for her. And today, NBC News Ashley Dyer talked to Lauren's family. She says this new discovery raises their suspicion. Lauren's family has walked through this park every day, twice a day, since Lauren went missing in mid June. Her top was found right here on July 2nd in this sandy area. Family members tell me if her shirt was lying here this whole time, it would have made it for now. I just want to say to anybody out there, just, you know, please, you know, let me know where my daughter is. So, you know, whatever it is, you know, I just let me know where she is. As her family struggles to stay hopeful. It has been like 18 days now. So, you know, every day that passes, we feel like the odds are getting less and less in our favor. The search for Lauren DeMillo continues. I think that, you know, somebody knows. And usually when somebody knows, and you know, more than one person always knows. Tonight, a new piece of evidence that family members think may be suspicious. Actually, 
blatant for more questions than answers, which is very frustrating. One of Lauren's shirts found lying in the sand at Four Freedoms Park. It was frequently worn by Lauren, but she has multiple pictures in that shirt. It wasn't like it was buried in the sand. It was just kind of plain that like somebody had just tossed it there. Now family members are left wondering, did they overlook it? We have searched that park two to three times a day, every day for like 10 days. Or was the shirt placed there? I was there, and checking out, I would definitely would have seen it. So it's a little odd that it just kind of showed up. Cape Coral police are following up on new leads, but so far, none of them have led to Lauren. You know, I've always looked up to her, so I just hope that, you know, she's okay, that she knows that we love her, we care about her, um, and we just want her home safe. There will be a community search for Lauren tomorrow night at 5 p.m. here at Four Freedom Park. If you've seen Lauren or you know anything about her disappearance, call police. Chris, for us, when we show up on a case like this, there's a, a, a lot of emotion as you deal with the family and with others. Uh, I think that this has introduced a new, new angle to all of this when all of a sudden we turn and say, hey, Trace Labs, help us find this. Robert, what kind of emotion do you feel as a, as a person trying to find a, a Lauren DeMolo? Yeah. So after doing SAR for 10 years, right, you get to see the the best and the worst case scenarios and the emotional impact uh, never really changes. I, you never really get numb to to that sort of uh, uh, experience. Right. So you go in, you're, you're talking to the families and things like that. And, uh, you know, just watching those videos. Right. It, you, you, you start to get that impact. So it and that never changes. So I think that the trace labs model as we come in and try to assist those families i think that's that's really the reward that we get right when we see uh the families in distress that's their worst day they're they're gonna have they can't find their daughter they they don't know what's going on so to be able to help in some way i think for us uh, is pretty rewarding and it's interesting to see the emotional response that we get from our contestants as well when they come in and they realize that, oh, th th these are real people that we're looking for. So it's, it's non-theoretical. It's not just like we're playing a game. It's, it's real life. So I think that that emotional impact that I get through SAR that I've had for over 10 years, and that's really what keeps me going. When we're on a search and we're going all night in the rain, uh, you think about the families and it keeps driving you forward. I think that our contestants, when we're doing a CTF for six hours, it's the same sort of thing. They're, they're getting tired. They're getting hungry. Um, and they also, you know, they want to win, but only one team wins. So that's not what's driving most of the people that are in our CTFs. So it's, it's really interesting to see that what I experience going through the bushes and the rain and the mountains transfer over to the CTF and going digital, which is much more scalable. So we can have hundreds of people doing what I'm trying to do alone. Right. So yeah, it's neat to see that transfer of emotion into, into this. So. Uh, so, Chris, what do you think? I mean, isn't that amazing? It's fascinating. I, I you know, you guys, uh, um, again, you know, I, I, I keep in my mind, I'm going back to what's the next level, right? Um, you know, have you seen, um, there was a recent research by the Secret Service out here uh, on the, on the, in the United States where, you know, they, they looked at school shooters and that type of, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. behavioral mindset. And they really started paying a lot of attention to, you know, pre-incident indicators. Yeah. Uh, and so are you guys, I mean, are you, are you focused in that vein as well? Have you seen that research uh, recently? I've done, yeah. looked at that research. There is a, uh, a great book called the, uh, the gift of fear. I think it's the gift of fear. Yeah. It's um, if you haven't read that, it's, it's fantastic. It talks about some of those precursors and what to watch for and things like that. Yeah. Um, Trace Labs isn't really um, into that yet, although we started, we are starting to get more into the analytic side of things. So um, I think that would probably be one of the next things that we begin to look at, but um, um, not not at this point. That's yeah. so well, fascinating. I, um, go ahead, Mike. Uh, Adrian, I, I think it's kind of interesting. In this particular case, Lauren's phone was found at home, but she apparently had a second phone and uh, and that has not been located. Tell me the kinds of things you're starting to think about and that you want to look for uh, as you do this case. 
Mm, absolutely, Mike. So typically what we see our contestants do in our uh, Capture the Flag events is they will try to pivot from known social media, email addresses, any profiles of a missing person they can find and start to use these uh, nifty techniques to see if they can uncover new phone numbers, new email addresses, and stuff like that. Uh, so in this case, for example, if there was a second phone and maybe there wasn't um, a known phone number associated to that, um, our contestants could help in maybe identifying what that second phone number might be. Um, so when we talk to our law enforcement partners, one of the most valuable pieces of intel they look for from us are new phone numbers. That's probably top of the list. Um, other things are like new email addresses, uh, new vehicles that are known to the missing person that might not be known before. Um, if you can pull a license plate off of that, that's even better. We've had a lot of success actually in that area where we had one event in Toronto where one of our contestants was able to pull a new license plate number from a new vehicle associated to a missing person just from watching hours of YouTube video footage. And we were able to provide this to um, Toronto police in real time. They followed up on it. They got a new address. They sent out a squad car. And shortly after, they were able to uh, confirm the new location of a missing person. Um, so that was really cool to see. Um, that's really where you're going to see the value of our model come in. Um, when a missing person's case is first published to the public, um, typically we don't come in right away. We typically come in shortly after. Once law enforcement has started working the investigation, we'll come in and provide some complimentary intelligence from our community and provide those new leads to them um, in the form of an intelligence report, actually, at the end of each of our operations. Wow, that's great. Uh, Chris, I, I kind of cut you off earlier. No, I, it, um, we live two types of lives, right, Mike? Um, and, you know, our, our public life and, and then our secret life, right? This is where all, you know, all sin and uh, we're the devil's playground. And this is really where you guys, uh, I really enhance that secret life. Uh, break, down a, break down a little when you say, you know, different types of uh, phones. So explain to, the, to our viewers here what, you know, like a burner phone and that, that type of stuff, you know. Uh, can mm -hmm. you kind of break that down, what exactly that means, uh, you know, for folks? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. So um, you spoke about there being like burner phones. So typically these are a secondary phone uh, held by an individual. They might be another smartphone. Um, they might be used for just various things. Uh, we actually see a lot of people have two phones even for work. They have one for their work life, one for their personal. Um, but typically what we do to try to track down these burner phones is we analyze as many images as possible from the missing person that are publicly available. We see if they're posting pictures that might have been posted from a different phone manufacturer than they're already known to have. That can help us identify what a second phone might be. Uh, we'll also try to look at their known social media accounts and see if we can pull a phone number out of that, see if we can identify that second phone as well. Uh, that's kind of the techniques that we see um, being used in that area. That's awesome. I, I want to I want to pop over to a map and kind of get a feel for uh, the area that we're talking about. <clears throat> and uh, this is a, a high res image of the home. Uh, Lauren's home is this one on the north end of the, the little apartment complex. And, and I'm only assuming that based on the fact that in one of the uh, news media reports, there was uh, documents on the front door and they were the news media was focused on that. But as we look at um, this location in comparison to where her purse is located and then where the, the uh, shirt is located, it really is only a, a short distance. This woman didn't have a vehicle. And so I thought it was kind of interesting uh, why she selected this particular area, how she gets around. Now, her boyfriend, I think, does have a vehicle, although I, I'm just speculating. Uh, but uh, the purse, I don't know where the purse was found in the park. I just captured a central point in the park. But the, it appears from the news reports that uh, the piece of red clothing was located here. 
which from a search perspective brings up all kinds of questions. And, and I haven't heard anything in regard to an underwater search or any kind of uh, search in the bay right there. But if it was an abduction that occurred in the park, it also unveils a whole different pathway for uh, removing this person from the area if, in fact, it's an abduction. Uh, Chris, any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, yeah, so, right, how comfortable is um, it when we do our victimology? Um, you know, how comfortable is the is this uh, young lady with that particular, you know, uh, point of interest, that park there? And I saw something on her uh, Facebook page that, you know, she she listed that particular park as uh, one of her uh, likes. And this would fall into what you guys do, right, uh, Adrian? I mean, I'm, as a, you know, an amateur uh, dark web guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Chris. Uh, what we'll typically see our community do with these cases is it'll start to uh, load up the locations on Google Maps. We'll start to zoom in, look at street view, and they'll start kind of walking the streets to see if there's any other clues that might help point them where the missing person might have gone. Um, a really cool technique we actually saw uh, last week at our event was one of our contestants was able to pull a Google ID straight from someone's Gmail address. And the thing about these Google IDs, um, when people set up a Google account for their Gmail, YouTube, and all of that, they're assigned a Google ID. And what people typically don't know is that that's linked to all of your Google activity, including Google Maps. So if you've ever uh, tagged a photo um, using that Google account before, um, we can actually use that Google ID and search Google Maps to see if any new locations have popped up via that Google ID. And that's actually what we saw last week. Um, one of our contestants was able to provide that. And now law enforcement can take that and see if there's any new locations that might have popped up since they went missing. So really cool technique there that we're seeing uh, from an open source intelligence perspective. That's awesome. We're going to watch a video of the boyfriend talking in a moment. And he speculates that she might have gone off with a friend who uh, may have uh, gave, given her some uh, narcotics, and then who knows what happens from there. I thought it was interesting because as I looked at the area, um, I went in and I looked at things like what are what are the bus routes in the area and how is she getting from point A to point B on bus lines. <clears throat> and as we start to look at the geography, we start to learn a little bit about more about her personality and the reasons for selecting this location. Uh, the bus stops are all pretty close, but but one of the things that I found was kind of interesting was to also take a look at where the uh, uh, narcotic or the marijuana dispensaries were in the area. And, and there is one uh, just uh, located over here uh, to the east of her residence. And, uh, and then uh, I found that, in fact, she actually chose to live in an area that is all um, zoned for the ability to have uh, narcotic dispensaries. I I thought it was weird. I don't know anything about this city or community, but I found that really intriguing and uh, wondered what your thoughts on that might be and if there are things on the dark web that can be uh, sought out. And while you're doing that, I'm going to, uh, Adrian or Robert, why don't you talk to that? And then I'm going to, in the background, try to pull up uh, this uh, news clip of the boyfriend talking. Mm hmm Absolutely. So when we look at the dark web and how it can be helpful in these cases, um, I would say when it comes to a narcotics subject, uh, typically you can look to see if uh, someone has a handle that they use on the open internet that is also being used on the dark web. And if you could see that being used on uh, you know, drug related forums, and you can maybe start to piece together if uh, they might have a drug habit or something of that nature. Uh, but typically when it comes to the sale of drugs on the dark web, uh, what happens behind the scenes there is not really open source anymore because it's kind of closed off in a forum or a transaction of some sort. Um, but really looking at the handles of someone, they might reuse that on the dark web as well. So, yeah. So, That's really interesting. So, the handle, go ahead. So, break that down. So, the handle, so our viewers understand what what exactly does that mean? For, I, yeah. I know what it means, but for our viewers. 
Great, great question. Yeah, I think the term handle is probably used most often in the tech space. It's really your username that you might use on a website. So, uh, for example, my handle is AK47Intel. You can find me there on Twitter. Um, I use that other places. Um, if I was stupid enough to use that in a dark web as well, then someone could trace my you know normal activities to my dark web activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reuse of that username as well, right? Most people reuse the same information over and over again. So rather than having a different username for every service, you're probably gonna have the same username for Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and all those different things. And so to be able to go into the forums where she's in and find that and then find her friends, find her habits, find those patterns of life, uh, that's what our contestants typically do. And, uh, and then you can find typically hints on where she might be going or might what she might be doing based off of that that's great let's let's play this video clip and uh hear what the boyfriend says her mother was last seen the last person to see her was her boyfriend who spoke exclusively with us tonight i don't think so she never know because she would have taken some at least some clothes and uh, her toothbrush all her makeup Mike News reporter Danielle Garcia talked with Gabriel Pena late this afternoon and joins us now live from Four Freedoms Park in Cape Coral. Danielle. Chris, Gabriel Pena told me that police brought him in to take a polygraph test and he said he passed. But now police won't confirm the test or the results or say whether he is a suspect in Lauren DeMillo's disappearance. But now her picture is posted here at Four Freedoms Park because this is where detectives found her purse. And that was three weeks ago weeks since Lauren DeMolo's family has been able to tell her they love her. Three weeks since anyone's been able to hug her. The last person to see her, Gabriel Peña, her boyfriend of four years. I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm not scared because I, I, I ain't doing anything, but I'm just worried that something really did happen. But you don't think she just left on her own now, do you? I don't think so. She left on her own because she would have taken some, at least some clothes. And, uh, her toothbrush, all her makeup. Pena told me he last saw her on Friday morning when he left for work. When he got home, Demolo was gone. So my, my thing is, is she went out with her, one of her friends. Her friend got her all messed up and drugged, and I don't know what. After that, I don't really don't know what happened. Police called Demolo's disappearance suspicious. Crime Stoppers is getting tips, but no big leads. At this point, everything attached to Lauren has been flagged. So, you know, if she went and she used a credit card or a debit card somewhere, we would know that. So it with every hour that passes, with every day that passes, it becomes a little bit more desperate um, to find out where she is. Her dad, Paul DeMolo, told me he believes his daughter is still alive. His fear is that her case will go cold. The wondering part is probably the worst. You know, even if the answer is bad, at least you have closure. Now, Paul DeMolo did tell me that he's prepared for the worst, but doesn't want to let his mind go there. He's trying to stay positive. And tomorrow at 5, people will be gathering at First Presbyterian, I'm sorry, Faith Presbyterian Church, where they're going to be looking for any clues as to where Lauren might have been. And we've pinned her picture at the top of the Wink News Facebook page. So go there, share it, share the information with your friends, your family. It only takes a second to share. Live in the Cape, I'm Danielle Garcia, Wink News Now. Danielle. So, Adrian, I, I find it interesting. Uh, the Crime Stoppers folks have, have flagged as many things as they're aware to flag. Maybe you could just spend a moment and talk about what offsets you and makes you a little different so that because um, you're not you're not exploring proprietary databases as part mm -hmm. of this OSINT operation. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. So what makes us really different here is exactly what you said. We're looking at what's open out there on an internet that might have changed in regards to the missing person. So typically when uh, law enforcement starts an investigation, they'll start looking at the social media and other aspects of a missing person. However, um, it's not really known if they continually check in every day or every week. However, when you bring in uh, someone like Trace Labs, like our model, we can start looking to see if there's anything new that might have popped up since they last investigated. And really what Crime Stoppers is doing there, as I said, is they're, they're flagging credit card transactions, stuff like that. It's all closed source um, that only they have access to or law enforcement has access to. Uh, real, we're really concerned with like what's open out there. What can anyone see? And because we put so many people on the case, uh, for example, last week we had 650 people 
working on eight cases, um, someone is bound to find something if there's something to find out there. Yeah, that's that's really amazing. Um, Robert and Chris, yeah. from from a search and rescue perspective, here's the neighborhood on the on the far east side. The the uh, bright uh, I don't know pink uh, point is is Lawrence home, and then on the upper left west side is the park. Let's talk about what you're going to do in a search here from a on the boots, on the ground kind of perspective. And uh, Chris, who, wh what resources are you calling out in this initial phase? Well, the, the first thing, obviously, the first call out is search and rescue. Um, and probably um, prior to those, you know, those resources coming on scene, you'd want to canvas that entire street right there with uh, LE resources. You want to ring bells, you know, doorbells, knock on, you know, everybody's uh, window. And, and what typically happens is you're going to have to log uh, if somebody was home or if they weren't home, uh, you know, if you got an initial statement, that type of stuff. And those gaps, you know, later on, uh, you'd want to recover, uh, a, you know, a conversation with those people at some point. And then the search and rescue guys uh, would come on scene and you would want to, you know, kind of put into a grid search. And, and Robert, why don't you uh, pick it up? Uh, yeah. You guys yeah, and, yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. I would, um, from a search and rescue perspective, you know, we'd want to contact the transit authority to get the footage from the buses. Um, we often find subjects that get on buses and, and just go somewhere. So to be able to see if she actually did do that, they end up, sometimes they can go very far, way out of the search radius that we're initially looking at. Um, so looking at that is a good good thing. Um, if there's some traffic cams, we could also take a look at that, start working directly with law enforcement on that. I'd also take a look at that park. We probably do a, a, a search within the park there uh, and also get a dive team in the river there if we have the resources uh, to take a look at that as well. Uh, from a tracking perspective, that park is going to be really well traveled. So it's going to be pretty difficult. I could bring in a dog team uh, if those resources are available. I think that would be the most effective at that point, um, especially if there's articles of clothing being found there. So that would be some of the first go-to things we would probably be looking at. Yeah, I mean, and now add to the mix these waterways. Holy cow, what a challenge for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. We should be. Yeah. We should also be considering the fact that um, uh, individually owned doorbells that are recording information, outdoor security cameras, other kinds of things like that are going to be accessed as part of all of this. And then, of course, we, we can't forget uh, the sex offenders in the neighborhood. Uh, again, we, we don't have yeah. anything to point to something like that. Um, here are a number of sex offenders, these uh, yellow tubes that are popping up on the map that are um, that are known to be in the area and that are registered. Uh, again, all the bus stop system and, and other uh, critical infrastructure there. But uh, it, it becomes a really interesting challenge for law enforcement, again, to put all these resources into something that isn't against the law. And uh, I wonder what your thoughts are as a group on that. Yeah, you brought up a really good point there, Mike. Uh, with the sex offender registries out there, you can start to look at who might be closest to where the missing person was last seen. And that's actually something we see from our community in our Capture the Flag events. They'll often go look at the registries and pull out the names that are in close proximity to where the missing person was last seen. And then we kind of curate that list as best as we can for law enforcement so that they can take a look and see if uh, that one of those people might be a suspect. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, Mike, one, and guys, one other consideration, right? I mean, if this was a kid, right, how much more amplified uh, are oh, yeah. situations, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, they usually, you know, what's the old saying? You know, you got 72 hours typically, right? I mean, you've yeah. got 72 hours. So, your, your resource now, I mean, it, you can really see the value of what you guys are bringing because, you know, traditional law enforcement as a whole, you know, 
I think everybody's still locked into that model of, you know, boots on the ground. Let's try to make this happen. Uh, yeah. I can only imagine, you know, lighting you guys up simultaneously and yeah. just, say, just say, tell me what you got. You know, yeah. you that, that's, yeah. crazy. that's awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think we're going to see that more and more. Uh, you know, we're one of the, the first to kind of come into the industry, trying to really pioneer that in the right way so that it's it's accepted. So some of the things we look at to make it an acceptable solution with partnering with law enforcement is we need to be cost effective. So we're, we're volunteers, we're crowdsourcing volunteers. So it doesn't cost law enforcement any extra money to do this. It's very scalable. So we can scale up very quickly, have lots of people looking in the area. It's like having a search team on the ground that just ramps up tremendously, right? So so that's really good. But then also being very respectful of law enforcement, right? We're not law enforcement. Our members are not law enforcement. So to be able to come in and help at the right time, but not interfere with that investigation, to not really kind of pollute the, the area uh, and, and being respectful of the family and friends as well, right? Um, I think, and then combining it with a global strategies because every every region operate slightly differently. I think for us, as as one of the first to kind of come in and help law enforcement like this, those have been kind of our, our challenges that we're really trying to stick to. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that's, I really like the way that you do things and the information that you bring. Um, just last Thursday, Chris and I reviewed the homicide of a, a nine-year-old boy in San Diego and during we did it as a live broadcast, we had thousands of comments streaming in from people with thoughts and ideas and and, and emotions. Uh, mm -hmm. I I look at this pool of people. How does somebody uh, say, "Hey, I want to I want to hook up with with Trace Labs and use the experience I've learned in finding things on the web to be able to to help in a case mm -hmm. like this." Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. Um, what we've really done is we've taken the on the ground search party and we've turned it into a virtual search party. So kind of expanding on uh, Chris's point earlier, uh, we do essentially like a call for uh, OSINT search party members um, for each of our events. So anyone who has done any internet searching before um, is eligible to participate in this. And really, we see people come in who have never done this before, and they pick it up very quickly. So the barrier to entry is very low for the people to get involved in a virtual search party of this nature. Uh, we see actually a lot of successes come from our new members, but also um, a lot of high successes come from the experienced online investigators that we have in our community. So, Robert, how do you get the word out to police departments. And we're, we're going to obviously hope that this gets some word out and we'll continue to pound yeah. the drum. And, and by the way, I gotta, I gotta thank you guys for, for being such good friends and sponsoring and helping out. And, and I should have mentioned near map who gives us incredible 3d imagery to us and, and allows us to use their services. Uh, but, but uh, I, let's say I want to make sure that, the uh, Salt Lake City Police Department knows about this. How am I getting the word yeah. out? Well, I would suggest they reach out to us or through you to us, uh, and then we have a conversation about how we can work with them. Uh, it, we're very easy to work with. We're very excited to work with law enforcement. We're also very aware that this is new for a lot of law enforcement agencies, and what we would do is probably give them a briefing about how we operate as an organization and to show them how we're a low risk model so they can ad adopt some of our benefits from, from what we do. Uh, and, but we're not gonna expose them to any unnecessary risk. And I think that's a big factor for them because you know, we don't wanna get in their way. We, all we wanna do is add value. All we wanna do is make this better for everybody. Uh, but it's new for a lot of law enforcement agencies. And so the, a good starting point is we just sit down we have a conversation, we talk about their needs, what they're looking for, uh, and, and what we provide as well. So they have a good understanding of how it works, how our CTF works, who we are, um, so we can mitigate any of that risk that could be involved in. We don't want to interfere with a, a live investigation. The last thing we want to do is, is impede an investigation. We want to actually make it better. Uh, and so all starts with a conversation. 
<laughs> you know, this is this is. I, I we're going to do a show soon on a book that I have coming out on a, a ritualistic cult that uh, sexually abused uh, thirty-two children over about a five-year period of time. There were literally four thousand counts of uh, child sexual assault in this case. And uh, recently, I've been interviewing some of the people involved, the investigators and uh, and the uh, social workers, and, and I was fortunate to lead this investigation. And as I was talking to one of the investigators, or one of the uh, social workers, uh, she was the uh, only person that we gave any heads up because we had to clear the calendars of a bunch of social workers on the day that we served the search warrant. She was the only person that we told what was going on. Everyone else thought they were showing up for parade duty at the police department at 4 a.m. And uh, and she confessed to me now after 30 years that she actually was whispering to her supervisor that she was going to be involved in this the next day. And a member of the media was outside of the door and that actually burned us. And, oh, and, wow. And so, yeah. <laughs> so I'm telling you this long, goofy story for two reasons. One, to shamelessly plug the fact that we're going to be talking about this soon. But the second is, Chris... We don't trust anybody in an investigation. How are we going to trust Trace Labs and others like them? Yeah, no, that's a great that is a great point, Mike. And I think you know these guys are the way you know the way of the future. I mean, in totality, because I think we would all agree uh, on this particular you know in this particular discussion here. Uh, this this these guys are getting you know very sophisticated. And, uh, you know, they're going underground and that dark web, uh, you know, what Adrian and, and Rob are both talking about, that is a key place that we really need to pay attention to. So I think it's going to be up to law enforcement to kind of uh, embrace the change and, uh, you know, move along with the timeshare and trust these guys to, you know, do what they do uh, because they're good at it. It's another tool in the toolbox. And man, if I had these guys, Boy, I'd, I'd, I'd be sitting on a show just like with this with you, Mike. You yeah, know, like, yeah. uh, you know hey, I mean? Robert, um, <laughs> we, number it's one, awesome. we, we absolutely laud the efforts of Trace Labs and the fact that you would bring out of the goodness of your heart what you've learned in the field and try to turn it into a way to globally reach people. Um, mm -hmm. why, why don't you uh, um, just take one moment and tell law enforcement, how they can be assured that the information you're collecting is not going to end up on CNN before they can get yeah. a search warrant served. Yeah, no, that, that's a fantastic question. So we, we were just talking about trust and how it's difficult for law enforcement to trust anybody during an investigation. And in the SAR community, we have the same sort of thing. We're very careful with the media. We're very respectful of, of the families. So I, I get it. And, and I expect that. And so that has been really uh, part of our mission with Trace Labs, uh, James, Adrian, myself, uh, and all of our members take that very seriously. And so when we're looking at a new relationship, starting a new relationship well, with law enforcement, we're not expecting to have a high level of trust there, especially at the very beginning. So we need to kind of prove ourselves, show us, show, show that agency how we operate, what controls we have in place, and, and exactly how it all works. And so we're very careful with our system our system is architected in such a way that it's not an open system, so you can't see what other teams are submitting. That's by design. Uh, also, when we submit the intelligence report to law enforcement, that is very controlled, and we can show law enforcement exactly how that works. But uh, I always suggest to law enforcement that, you know, don't, don't trust us. I, I don't expect you to trust us. I expect you to test us and to examine us and then work with us very slowly to develop that relationship until you're comfortable. Because I, I get it, it's a very sensitive area and we're dealing with real people, real families, uh, loved ones on, on their worst possible day. So uh, it's a new technology, we're a new, a new service. And uh, what I would ask is we just take it step at a time and let us show you how it works, let us show you how OSINT works and just take it a step at a time. I, I really appreciate that and uh, I have been watching you guys now for i think it's been about two or three months hasn't it adrian that we've been communicating and i want you to know how impressed i am 
with the way in which you do things, but being able to watch you in action uh, last week as you managed all of those uh, volunteers. And, and I got to say thanks to all those volunteers. Uh, it, it was just really impressive. And I look forward to seeing how we continue to find ways to work together. I hope you guys will come back on and we can talk about other cases in the future. Absolutely, Mike. We would love to be back on. Yeah. Love to. Um, Adrian, give them a website that they can go to. Uh, you you shamelessly figured out how to get your at uh, AK47 in there. <laughs> but let's be over okay. and let's make sure they know how to find you too. Yeah, so I'll do a, a few shameless plugs uh, right now. So first, our website, it's www.tracelabs.org. That's T-R-A-C-E-L-A-B-S.org. Um, on our Twitter, you can find us at Trace Labs as well. And actually special today at the time of its recording, uh, July 20th, um, we just announced our next OSINT search party event. It's open to the public. We have typically up to 650 people register. That is uh, available for registration. Uh, you can find that at tracelabs.eventbrite.com. Um, and that's where you'll find uh, the sign up link there. Um, and then just one more plug, um, the trending hashtag we have going around on our Twitter, everything we're doing, it all really comes back to what you see here in my shirt for good. So if you ever see this flying around there on Twitter or any social media, um, you'll see Trace Labs and other organizations are really leveraging their OSINT skills for good in this area. That's fantastic. Chris, any thoughts before we start to close this thing down? These guys are fantastic. I can't wait to see some of the incredible results. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, we'd we'll love, love to have you out at an event uh, virtually, Chris, uh, for the next hey, one. Hit us up. I, I can help support you guys. That'd be great. Seriously, I really would. Hey, guys, um, I hope that you'll uh, – we're going to – this should hit the airwaves tomorrow. Uh, give us a little time for uh, to get this put together and posted up. And we hope that you'll uh, push it out to your group of people. You have a huge audience, and we would appreciate them getting to know who we are. And, and to everyone out there, we really appreciate your sponsorship and the opportunity that we have to bring these things to you. If you think they're worthwhile, consider uh, figuring out a way to sponsor and help out. And uh, please make sure you're liking and sharing and all of that stuff, and you're ringing the bell and uh, and you're making sure that others know about us. We're growing very quickly, and we just attribute all of that to each of you. So thank you so very much. And, and uh, to kind of whet your appetite for what is coming in the future, um, let me just uh, add this here. Uh, this, this is just a map of uh, women in the last 20 years who have disappeared in the United States that fit a profile or similar to Lauren DeMolo. Uh, this is a serious problem that's going on. In this particular image, uh, the, the uh, big uh, orange points are missing people, real people that disappeared. The uh, um, blue points on the map are actually a serial killer that uh, I had the opportunity of interviewing and have worked for a number of years who love to select victims that are in this age range. He's now been in prison for a long uh, number of years and will spend the rest of his life there. But it shows the number of places that he traveled as a truck driver during that time. And think about the potential of victims within those areas that could have been victimized by him or, or others. We hope that you will report any kind of information you know about any missing person and particularly Lauren DeMolo, so that her family might get some understanding of where she is and we can figure out and get her home. I can uh, very comfortably say that the police department is doing all that it can to help bring her home and hopefully they'll access things like these guys. And, uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us and please uh, consider continuing to, to join with us.